Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Wild Side of STEAM, where we explore the unusual careers in science, technology, engineering, art, and math at the Smithsonian's National Zoo. My name is Shelly, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'll be your host for today. In a couple minutes, we'll meet our guest and hear all about an unusual job, horticulturist. While we wait for more friends to join, you will see a quick poll question pop up on your screen. And that reads, do you know what a horticulturist is? Yes or no? While you take a minute to submit your answers, I'm gonna go over the format of today's webinar. This webinar is live captioned. You'll see, uh, you'll need to locate that CC button at the bottom of your screen for those to appear. In addition to the closed captioning, we also have an American Sign Language interpreter. Uh, you should be able to see both of us on your screen, but if you cannot, try adjusting your view to speaker view or um, gallery view, and you can pin her video as well. Our program today will be about 40 to 45 minutes with an additional 15 minutes at the end to answer as many questions as we can. Remember, this is a webinar, so we cannot see or hear you, nor can you see or hear each other. You can, however, interact with us in a number of ways. As you see, we already have um, some polls going and we'll be issuing a few more throughout our program today. Additionally, you will see that that Q&A is open. So please, at any time throughout our program today, you can drop any questions in there for me or our guest. Try to keep your questions on topic and only ask them once. You can look at your previously asked questions in that column to see if someone behind the scenes has already answered one of your questions. And lastly, you'll see that our chat is open as well for you to message us. Now I want you to find that chat and tell me your name and where you're joining us from. And while you do that, I want to introduce some folks behind the scenes. We have Erica, Caden, Jess, Alexander, and Casey helping to respond to your questions and chats. But we have an extra special guest today. We have Teresa Vedic, curator of horticulture, also in the chat helping to respond to your questions. So let's see where folks are joining us from. Uh, we have Kinder Care in Massachusetts. We have Ali or Ali from New York. Lily, Levi, uh, Ani, George from Hungary. Oh my goodness. Uh, we have folks from Tacoma, Washington. Dawn from Delaware. Uh, let's see. Um, Maryland, Jack from Maryland. Uh, Miss Eclio and Miss E from Houston Elementary School in Washington, DC. Local, love to see it. We have Melissa and Emma from Idaho. Um, and we have folks from Wichita, Kansas. We have folks from Idaho and hi Trinity, wonderful. So once again, everybody, welcome to the wild side of STEAM. And I am so thrilled to be joined by Tina Scott, horticulturist at the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute. Hi Tina and welcome. Hi, Shelly. So why don't you start by telling us what a horticulturist is? Okay, I can do that. Actually, I'm going to put my glasses on so I can see you. <laughs> ah, there you are. <laughs> um, yeah, sure. So a horticulturist, um, well, actually, let me start by saying what I am not, okay? Um, a lot of people confuse horticulture with botany, and I am not a botanist by any any stretch of the imagination. Um, botany is really like a pure science. It's the science of plant life. Um, those folks, they're going to study genetics or the physiology of different plants. Um, but horticulture, it is a branch of biology, um, but we are actually dealing more, it's an applied science. So we're actually taking that science that the botanists have, have learned about plants and we're applying it to actually grow them. So it Horticulture tends to focus on edible plants, so your vegetables, um, and in ornamental plants, so just your, your pretty gardens. Yes. So how does this apply to a career at the zoo? Well, I do a lot of things that are pretty typical of any horticulture position uh, anywhere. Um, 
we here at the zoo, we have a couple of what we call enhancement gardens. So we have a butterfly garden, we have a cactus garden, we have a garden that's called the zoo in your backyard. Uh, I think those are some of the pictures from that, um, where the zoo in your backyard is designed to sort of show people what they can do in their own backyard to attract wildlife um, so that you can have a zoo in your own backyard. Um, and we also have a bunch of just regular tropical gardens all throughout the zoo. Uh, we also do our seasonal plantings, which would be, you know, like the colorful annuals that you might see at our front entrance and that sort of thing. Um, and we also have, we do have a greenhouse here at the zoo where we mostly use it to store our tropical plants. Uh, we use a lot of tropicals in the summer, but our location here in DC, it's just too cold for them to stay out all year round. So we bring them inside for the winter and take care of them up in the greenhouse. So every winter I have a nice uh, tropical paradise up in my greenhouse. I'm so um, jealous. <laughs> to, to hang out with. Um, but, but zoo horticulture is actually a little bit more specialized even than that. Um, because we're putting plants into animal exhibits, uh, we have to know things about plant toxicity. You know, we certainly don't want to make any animal sick after they've eaten some leaf that might be toxic. Uh, we need to know how, we need to know about the animals too. We need to know how they interact with plants. Um, and then we also do some cool things. Some of the more fun things are we will go into exhibits and create animal dens and we'll create um, climbing structures for some of the different animals. I see we're looking at some of these awesome pictures now of some of these dens that are hard to see, that main wolf one and that giant panda, of course, hammock and climbing structure was yep. down to the sea. Now you mentioned a lot of these different gardens in the zoo. Um, and I wanna know from our audience, which garden at the zoo would they most like to take care of? Is it that butterfly garden that you mentioned, the cactus garden, the tropical greenhouse, or that zoo in your backyard? Tina, do you have a favorite garden that you love? I know you mentioned that it's nice to work in the warm greenhouse uh, in the winter. Do you have another garden that you love to care for? It is very nice to be in the greenhouse in winter. Um, gosh, my favorite garden. Yeah, I really do enjoy working with the tropical plants in some of our tropical gardens. Um, my least, I can tell you easily what my least favorite garden is, and that's the cactus garden. Um, on, you know, it's, it's lovely because you can sort of plant a cactus and then pretty much ignore it. You know, you don't want to water cactuses, you know, cacti, so they're kind of, you know, plant them and forget them. But boy, when you've got to pull some weeds around those suckers and, you know, um, yeah. you know, clean up leaves around them and you're ending up the whole rest of the week pulling spines out of your out of, out of your hands. hands. <laughs> Lots of band-aids to go through. Let's see what our uh, audience had to say. Um, so the majority of them said they would want to work with the butterfly garden. That's wonderful. Followed closely also by that tropical greenhouse. I love that. So obviously you work with a huge variety of different plants, as you just mentioned, from those tropical ones all the way to those cactus, cacti that you barely need to water. Right. Um, do they all require the same care? They don't. Um, you know, we, I do take care of quite a lot of plants, um, but they are kind of widespread in, in their care. I mean, if you think about even just orchids, I think there's more than, what is it, 25,000 species of orchids in the world, um, and they're, you know, all different, and so, you know, here at the zoo, you know, I'm certainly not taking care of 25,000 species of orchids, thank goodness, um, but, you know, here at the zoo, we have a really big deer problem. The white-tailed deer are just all over our park, and so, unfortunately, our diversity in our outdoor plantings has really suffered over the years. Um, but I do tend to work with a lot of tropical plants for, for some reason they don't, yeah, there's those deer. <laughs> yep, that on that, that picture on the right there, that's a deer in my butt in the zoo in your backyard. Yeah. It was just munching away. Didn't care at all that I was standing right in front of her. That's such um, a funny point in that people think of all of our zoo animals, but we have wild animals that also visit our park quite frequently that you don't have to, it's something to think about that you have to worry about all these beautiful plants for our guests, but the wild deer interact with those as well. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're, they're, I, I love deer. They're beautiful. They're adorable, but ooh, they cause a lot of damage, <laughs> a lot of damage. Um, but yeah, but you know, so our diversity has really suffered because of the deer. 
Um, but we also work with a lot of tropical plants. For some reason, the deer don't seem to be as interested in tropical oh. plants. So I've started incorporating more tropicals into the landscape. Um, but even within tropical plants, you know, they're all different. You take care of them different ways. And even one single plant in one location will behave totally different than it will in another location based on its light and how wet the soil is and that sort of thing. So it's, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. <laughs> wow. So as a previous animal keeper myself, your job sounds very similar to that of a zookeeper um, in that all these plants have different and very specific needs and specialized care. What other similarities to your job taking care of plants are there to the, that of an animal keeper who's caring for the living collection? You know, um, so here at the National Zoo, our animal keepers and our horticulture staff, we're all under the umbrella of uh, living collections. So just like the animal keepers, we're taking care of stuff that's alive. Um, and I guess the biggest difference I see between like my job and an animal keeper is obviously my job is a lot less stressful. Um, if an animal dies, that's a really big deal. If, you know, in the picture behind you, if one of those bananas dies, it's okay, I'll make a phone call and get a new one tomorrow, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, but kind of the neat thing is, um, you know, of course, obviously, plants and animals, they both require some of the same things, food, water, you know, a suitable habitat to live in. Um, you know, again, I can put off feeding my plants for a couple of days or weeks, but you have to feed your animals every single day. Um, but to me, one of the coolest things is the way plants, a lot of plants anyway, have adapted uh, to have these crazy defensive mechanisms um, to protect them from predators, including, you know, people. So, you know, plants may not have brains, um, but they've really come up with some really great ways to protect themselves. Um, you know, of course, we mentioned cacti. You're not going to mess yeah. with cactus because they're going to hurt you. Um, but other plants, uh, there's, for example, there's a, a tree in our Amazonia exhibit, and it's called the sandbox tree. Wow. Um, it's often called the monkey no climb tree because it has these very sharp spines. So there you are. Wow. If you're a little monkey and you're at the bottom of that tree looking up at that thing, you're probably going to go look for a different tree to climb up. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you that it, they, those little spines, they hurt. <laughs> I can tell you that. They look um, like they do. And you, even if you, if the monkey makes it up that tree somehow, um, you know, limping up the, to that tree and starts chewing on some of those leaves, they're going to find really quickly that there's a toxic sap in the oh, leaves. Wow. Um, I don't know. I've never tried eating one, but I do know that, you know, even just getting that sap on your skin causes really painful red welts. Wow. Um, and then if, if, if you survive all of this from this tree, um, the fruits on the sandbox tree, when they, when they ripen, they'll actually explode and send seeds shooting you know, hundreds of feet away at up to 160 miles an hour. Um, they sometimes call it the dynamite tree. So, you know, in my job, I may not have to worry about a lion maybe trying to bite me or something, but I, I have, trust me, many, many scars on my body to show that plants can be pretty tough too. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I love that you mentioned that just like animals, like a lion might bite if they feel threatened, these plants also have very similar defense mechanisms just to survive. I love yep. that. And you mentioned you work very closely with the animal care staff to select plants that go in the animal exhibits. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you choose which plants go in exhibits? Yeah, so uh, when we're you know, trying to decide what plants to put into an exhibit, um, there's so many things you have to think about. And probably one of the first things is, you know, what, what is the animal that's going to be in the exhibit? You know, you're obviously not going to try to create a, an exhibit that looks like a grassland if you're going to put in an animal from the tropical rainforest in there. That just, that, that wouldn't be right. Um, so you want to try to think about what's going to look most natural. Um, but then you have to start to get kind of realistic. And this is a little bit harder because, um, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our exhibits are older. And back when they were built, you know, we are redoing a lot of our exhibits. I know you all had Matt Sellers on a couple weeks ago yeah. talking about our new birdhouse. And that's really exciting. But a lot of our older buildings that haven't been redone yet, they just, when they built them, they weren't thinking about 
growing plants in the buildings. The focus was on the animal. Right. And so they're dark. They just don't have enough sunlight for a lot of these plants. There's no irrigation. Even if there was irrigation, there's no drainage. Um, they're just really, really tough places to try to grow plants. Um, so then you have to kind of say, okay, I really want to use this plant but it's never going to grow in these conditions. So I'm going to try this plant that kind of looks like, you know, what I'm, what I'm trying to get across. Right. Um, but then of course it doesn't end there because then we do have to worry about that plant toxicity that we talked about. Um, and every plant that goes into an exhibit has to be approved by our zoo nutritionist. And they have a bunch of databases that they can look in and see, you know, which plants, plants are toxic, you know, how toxic are they? Um, you know, can we use that plant in, in a particular exhibit? Um, and sometimes, you know, it also depends on the animal. Some animals just don't care at all about the plants that are in their exhibits. Um, some, and this is where it gets really fun, um, is you have situations where you put plants, you spend a lot of time and a lot of effort putting plants into exhibits. Um, we had one situation we spent a lot of time, actually, I actually wasn't involved in this planting, I'm kind of glad I wasn't, uh, but our, our folks you know, planted, spent a lot of time redoing the Asian otter exhibit Mm. put all these fantastic grasses. It looks so natural. It was beautiful. And then the otters came in the yard and just started ripping up. Yep, there he is. <laughs> started ripping up the grasses and they used, they pulled up all the grasses and they used them in their little chute that goes from their outdoor yard, our yard to the indoor. You know, it was comfortable, you know, I guess made a lovely bed. Um, I had a, another situation in the small mammal house where I had a colleague help me, and I know he's still angry at me for this, but we carried in three really large ficus trees to put into a lemur exhibit. And they're huge. And we had to drag them into these tiny little doors that the keepers have to go through to get into the exhibits. And it was hot. And the whole time the lemurs are just screaming at us. I mean, they were just so excited that something was going on in their, in their exhibit. So we, we plant one tree and, you know, we're digging the holes and we get the tree in. We said, okay, good. We've got one down, two to go. We turn around, we start planting the second tree. And I turn around and, you know, those lemurs are already sitting in that tree, chewing the leaves. <laughs> and even if they weren't eating the leaves, they would just pull them up, rip them in half and drop them. And you know, it's like, you know, you couldn't even wait until I was out of the exhibit. <laughs> So we ended up, we planted all three. Um, oftentimes, if something's new in an exhibit, the animals will be interested. But after a while, they're like, oh, it's just a tree that's boring. These lemurs never got tired of those trees. And within about two weeks, we took them out because they were dead. Wow. <laughs> so so it, it's uh, yeah, job security, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like your job comes with a lot of these challenges that maybe horticulturists outside of the zoo might not have to deal with. Right. Um, I do have another poll for our viewers about this plant toxicity that you mentioned. You obviously we want to make sure, especially with things like our lemurs and our otters that are choose to dig up all of the lovely planting that you do. So which of the following is not safe to plant in animal exhibits? Uh, these you can select all that apply. Water, hemlock, nightshade, poinsettias, and lily of the valley. Let's see what our audience thinks about these. I'll give you a couple more seconds to answer that poll. Some quick responders here. Um, all right, I'll give you another few seconds to answer that poll. We'll close it in five, four, three, two, one. Let's see. All right, you all were spot on. So Tina, our viewers guessed that poinsettias were toxic, but they we had guesses for all of them. Which ones were toxic, Tina? Uh, well, the great news is they're all toxic. Um, yeah, and, and that's one thing that I have learned that kind of surprised me is, is I've tried to you know, work on exhibits, almost everything is toxic. <laughs> it's a, particularly these tropical plants tend to have some level of toxicity, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of toxic plants out there. <laughs> 
So we have a great question. Um, somebody would like to know how you decide whether or not to use native plants versus non-native um, plants, whether in the butterfly garden or even the zoo in your backyard garden. That is a very good question. Um, yeah, that's a very good question. <laughs> come back to that so, in the Q and A. So, uh, you know, we definitely do try to plant as many natives as we can. The problem that we have here, and as I mentioned, is our deer. Right. And we unfortunately just don't have, we don't have the, the luxury necessarily of choosing <laughs> what we want. Uh, we're really, we're really struggling to find things that the deer won't eat. Um, and you would think that native plants, maybe they wouldn't eat them, that they've you know, evolved with the white-tailed deer and they right. just kind of leave them alone, but no, they don't. Um, so you know, for a long time, we really, really tried to focus on natives. And as the deer populations have grown in the area, we now, I will plant whatever I think has a chance of not getting eaten. Yeah. That's, that's the sad truth about it. <laughs> that's great. But good question. <laughs> um, so the zoo's mission is to save species. So how do you as a horticulturist help in the zoo's mission of saving species? Um, well, you know, I mean, plants, you know, like animals, plants can be endangered, they can be threatened, they can go extinct. Um, and same with animals, you know, the main reason for this is habitat loss. Um, you know, I think it's really important for people to see zoo animals in as close to a natural habitat as they as we can possibly manage to give them because uh, we really want people to see the relationship between plants and animals whether the animal is using that plant for food or shelter or camouflage you know whatever it is we want people to see and understand that the habitat is so important for these animals. Um, and, you know, and, and then you hope that maybe you know, that knowledge will make people a little more aware of the implications of habitat destruction. Um, and also for me, you know, working in our outdoor gardens, you know, again, as much as I can within the constraints of our white-tailed deer population, I try to plant flowers and design our gardens in a way that's gonna benefit um, our native local pollinators and, and other wildlife and, and sort of, you know, focus at home and try to save what, you know, we can here. Well, I certainly wanna hear more about pollinators and I wore my bee overalls because I knew that we would be talking about how important pollinators are. And I have another poll for our wonderful audience. Which of the following do you think are important pollinators? Bees, bats, birds, or butterflies? And this one you can select all that you think. And I'll give you another few seconds to answer that. All right, so many um, answers coming in and there. We have some wonderful pictures for reference. Right. I'll give you another five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Let's see what folks said. All right. All right, Tina, do you want to go over these results? The majority said bees, but the bats, birds, and butterflies were not far behind. So which of the following are important pollinators, Tina? And, and once again, everyone wins. Yes. <laughs> we try to make everyone happy here. Yeah. yeah, all of those things, bees, bats, birds, butterflies are all great, um, great pollinators. Um, yeah, er, yeah, they're all, all correct answers. Wonderful. Um, so can you talk a little bit about, a little bit more in depth about what you're doing in the park to help our native pollinators? Sure. Um, yeah, we, are really trying to focus on our native pollinators. We recently, a couple of years ago, opened a, a, a what's it called, Me and the Bee garden uh, down at the bottom of our zoo where we're trying to really highlight pollinators. Um, you know, they're so, you can't overstate the importance of pollinators. You know, if you like having food to eat, you need to thank a pollinator, right. uh, whether it is the bee or the bat or the butterfly or the bird. Um, and you know, you've probably heard in the news a lot over the last couple of years about honeybees and the declining populations. Uh, but 
like we've said, we just learned, you know, honeybees are not the only pollinators out there. Right. Um, in North America, there's more than 4,000 species of you know, native bees. And in many cases, they're more efficient at pollinating than those honeybees, which by the way, are not native to the United States yes. or to North America. Um, and you know, so many of these bees, there's the you know, mason bees and these solitary bees and little flies that are such great pollinators and they're beautiful. They're like these iridescent shades of blue and green. And you know, you come out into a garden and you see the beautiful flowers and then these really cool bees and flies on top, you know, swarming all over them. I mean, it's just, it's, it is a wonderful sight. Um, so we really have tried to focus on um, doing as much as we can to support those populations as well. I love that. We definitely need to thank our pollinators. I love that. Um, so how did you get into this career as a horticulturist? Uh, well, I will say that I know this is, this event is designed for middle school um, students and I, and I will readily admit that when I was in middle school, I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. Um, but I did enjoy, and my mother liked having her little garden and I enjoyed going to the nursery with her and helping her plant and water her flowers. Um, and I also, I've always been crazy about animals. So I guess I was probably heading in this direction without even really knowing it. Um, but horticulture is actually my second career. Um, I worked for many years as an editor and I was, you know, I never really enjoyed having a desk job. Um, I like to be outside. I like to move around. Um, and I was working as an editor for the American Horticultural Society. And we worked on this beautiful property. There were gardens outside my window. And I would, you know, be sitting at my desk writing about horticulture or editing other people's articles about horticulture and watching the gardeners actually work outside. And I just thought, what am I doing? I, that's what I want to be doing. Yeah. Um, so I somehow then stumbled across just the idea of zoo horticulture. And I thought, oh, that could be it. Um, so I actually sent an email to the zoo, to this zoo, um, to the head of horticulture at that time. And you know, said, I'm really interested in this field of zoo horticulture. Can you help me? Can you tell me about it? And he was so excited that anyone had even heard of zoo horticulture that he called me right away. And I came in, we met, he told me about it. Um, I soon started volunteering at the zoo, doing some horticulture work. And I started going back to school and ended up getting a degree in horticulture. And here I am. <laughs> That's amazing. So is your degree in horticulture, was that like, um, from a bachelor's of science, a bachelor's of art for your school, two year school? So I initially, my, my, my first run at college, I actually was an English degree, which is okay. how I ended up being the, the an yeah. editor. Um, and when I was interested in going back for horticulture, what I learned is all of my general classes were sort of already covered. So I went to the com local community college and just took, just took all the horticulture classes. Mm -hmm. So ultimately I have an, an associates in applied science in horticulture. Wow, that's great. I love that there's just so many different paths into the general conservation field and the path to horticulture. That sounds great. Yeah, and I'll say, you know, I want to throw out just, you know, for people, if you, when you start talking to people in the zoo, it's particularly true with the animal keepers. I'm sure you know, Shelly, but everyone volunteers here and that's how they've kind of gotten their start. And that's such a good idea to do whatever it is you think you're interested in doing, just go out and try it. Um, you'll quickly learn if you hate it <laughs> or if it's something you might wanna consider. I kind of wish I had done that earlier in my life so I would have not wasted my time Probably editing. But, um, but yeah, it's, yeah, go out and get out there and see what you like to do. I love that. So this is um, the wild side of STEAM and we are focusing on careers in the realm of science, technology, engineering, art, and math. So how do you use STEAM in your career? Uh, well, the science, like I'd mentioned, you know, horticulture is an applied science. So the science of plants, you know, pretty much informs everything we do. Um, even if we don't realize it, even if we're not thinking about it, you know, it's in the back of your head somewhere. Yeah. Um, you know, technology, I do use a cup, um, uh, in a, a computer program, a, a landscape design program that helps, um, design some of our landscapes, some of our gardens. 
Um, I think there might be, oh yeah, so, yeah there's one of our oh, pictures. Wow. That's actually our, our carousel and it's a rain garden that's around the carousel. Um, Can you explain what a rain garden is? I can. So a rain garden, you know, one of the problems you have um, that we have now nowadays is we get so much rain and with all of our hard surfaces, you know, driveways and your front yard and the roads, water doesn't really have anywhere to go. So we get these really hard rains and the water just flows, you know, unimpeded and it ultimately ends up, you know, it filling up our storm drains and causing floods and whatnot. So by creating a rain garden, what you're doing is um, it's sort of a dug out little area and, you know, you plant, you fill it up with plants that like wet conditions. And what happens is when it rains, the water will flow into this sunken in area and sit and the plants will, you know, soak up the water. And over time, the water will just suck, you know, suck, be sucked down into the ground. Um, but it just helps the water go to where it should be going, which is in the ground and not just straight down the road until it finally runs into whatever. Um, so yeah, so we have, yeah, this great right rain garden that's right next to our carousel. In the zoo. And it's something to think about, first of all, thinking about, again, the diversity of plants. So picking the plants for that rain garden that um, like a lot of water. So obviously you probably want plant a cactus there that doesn't need that much water. Right. It's also nice to think <laughs> about, it's a nice reminder that the National Zoo is located in the center of Washington, D.C., so a rather urban zoo, and as you mentioned, with a lot of the paving going on in the city, so providing a place for that rain to go and creating beautiful gardens. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit more about um, the technology um, and the art and the math that you use in your job? Sure. So, yeah, so we use that program. Um, oh, uh-oh, we lost our video, didn't we? That's too bad. Um, <laughs> We, uh, let's see, science, technology, um, engineering, honestly, I'm sure I use engineering. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> uh, maybe not so much engineering. Um, art, uh, I'm actually really excited that art is now part of that whole STEM, right. that it's become STEAM, um, because you know, art is a, certainly a very big part of what I do, what we do. Um, you know, when I'm trying to figure out what to plant in a garden, you know, I'm looking at not just the how to grow the plants, but, you know, what does it look like? What is the size? What is the shape? What's the texture? What's the color? Um, you know, that sort of thing. So there really is a big artistic component to horticulture, for sure. Um, math, yeah, I use it. Um, I was never fond of math in, in school, and I said, oh, I'll never use this. Why do I need to know it? I needed to know it. Um, you know, we need it for calculating fertilizer application rates and, you know, things like that. Wow. So you, we really do kind of use all of those STEAM, STEAM topics. Wow. That's really, really great. Um, so here at the zoo, as we mentioned multiple times, you know, our, our mission is to save species and everyone has their own kind of conservation passion. What would you say is your number one conservation passion? This is tough, isn't it? I, conservation, I think, is one of those things that sometimes feels so overwhelming because there's so much <laughs> that needs to be done. So many things need to be conserved. Um, but, you know, I am very passionate about, you know, just the planet. I mean, I, I love nature. Obviously, that's why I do what I do. Um, I love being outside. I love to hike. I love to camp. I kayak. Um, and I guess probably the, the, my biggest pet peeve is seeing trash. Um, you see so much trash along hiking trails and especially in the water, um, which is just so horrible and so much plastic. Um, you know, I live very close to the Potomac River, which comes through you know, Virginia, Maryland, yeah. D.C. And, you know, and several, several of the tributaries go near my house. And so usually on the weekends, I, I do a little loop walk, a three mile walk, and I take a bag with me and pick up trash as we go, because otherwise I know it's going to end up in those waterways, which just drives me crazy. Um, you know, it's just, like I said, it's such a huge topic. It feels overwhelming. So I just kind of try to, you know, take a deep breath and do what I can do every day, which 
you know, if I pick up a piece of trash or if I'm out in the kayak and I see some trash floating, I'll try to pick it up. Um, but things like that. And of course, you know, try, trying to plant things for the pollinators and that sort of thing too is very important to me. I think that's wonderful bringing it back to remember that everything is this giant ecosystem and the plants and the animals are all affected by each other. So when we kind of help to pick up that trash, we can help both our plants and our animals. Um, before we move on to our wonderful Q&A, which we have so many great questions coming in. So folks, please keep sending in your questions. Um, you will said you had a special interest in working at the zoo because you love animals. Do you have a favorite animal? I have many favorite animals. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I love them all, but uh, you know, I've, I've been at the zoo for 18 years and okay. almost 19 years. And I did actually, oddly enough, uh, in sort of a fluke situation, ended up working as an animal keeper for about five or six oh. years. And the area, I, I know, crazy, right? Uh, the area I worked in is called American Trail. So it's native, you know, North American animals. So I'm kind of partial to those animals. Um, you know, we had, you know, seals and sea lions. Who doesn't love a seal and a sea lion? You know, I love the pelicans, American river otters. You are wonderful. But I think probably my favorite were actually the beavers. Oh. Um, they are so, and it's funny, I think Matt Sellers in one of the, the past STEAM webinars mentioned the beavers too. Um, they're so cool. And there are now, there are two beavers at the zoo now. The four that I worked with um, were just so much fun and they had such distinct personalities. And, you know, just watching them in their habitat, there's the habitat that they, uh, that we have at the zoo has a waterfall. It's kind of a, a faux dam and, but the water still flows over it. And these beavers would take whatever logs or, you know, sticks that we'd give them and try to stop that water, you know, and it's just fascinating that instinct they have to stop the water. Um, and it's just, you know, they're amazing. You know, they call them nature's engineers and the way that they can, you know, affect their own environments and, you know, essentially create entire new ecosystems is just, I, I just think they're super cool. And I know they're not pandas and everybody loves pandas at the zoo, but I think the beavers are, are highly uh, underrated and, and yeah. need to be, need to be celebrated. We love all of our animals <laughs> and want to celebrate all of our animals. I'm now just trying to imagine um, our horticulture team and you trying to identify trees that the beavers wouldn't try to create dams out of and tear down for you. What a challenge that must right. be. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. All right, so we have tons of great questions and you did just mention pandas, so I'm gonna answer this right now. Do you have anything to do with the bamboo growing for pandas? I do not. Um, years ago, the horticulture department did um, go out and cut bamboo for the, the pandas, but it is a, it is a big job. So um, it actually now our animal nutrition department takes care of that. And we have several sites, uh, you know, off site at the zoo where they go a couple times a week and cut just truckfuls and truckfuls of bamboo. Um, certainly at the zoo, you know, whenever I'm out, if I, or any of us, we cut a piece of bamboo and people say, oh, are you taking that to feed the pandas? Um, no, probably not. <laughs> um, you know, you would have to grow so much bamboo uh, to feed those guys um, that, no, we, we don't actually do it. It's, it's handled by, by a commissary. Yeah. Yes, they're, they get fed quite a bit of bamboo. Yes. <laughs> so I can imagine that is quite a big undertaking. Um, do you have a favorite plant in the zoo or in general? Oh boy. Yeah, this is tough. You know, I, I feel like whenever I learn about a new plant, you know, like that sandbox tree that I was talking about. I mean, how cool is that? You know, uh, there are so many plants out there. I really do tend to love the plants that have a story behind them. You know, so many plants have, you know, these historical, you know, like folklore stories and really cool things in mythology and everything. But, but to be, not to be too simplistic, I probably think some of my favorite flowers are the spring bulbs. You know, they're coming up now here in our area. You know, we've had a cold winter and all of a sudden you see this, you know, daffodil pop up and it's so simple. They're everywhere, but 
you know, I just, I love them. They just, they give you hope. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think all those spring bulbs are probably my favorites. They're beautiful and they're all coming up now. It makes me happy. Um, Phaedra has a wonderful question. She said that she would like to know what kind of plants um, would be best for her own butterfly garden, which we love to hear. Plant your own pollinator garden. Yeah, yes. Yeah, please do. That's a great, great idea. And especially if you don't have deer, they were going to eat all your flowers. <laughs> it's even a better idea. <laughs> for butterflies, you know, it depends largely on where you live um, because there's different butterflies live in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. But so my suggestion would be, you know, get online and try to learn what butterflies are in your area, because a lot of butterflies have very specific plants that they like for food, um, you know, in their, when they're larvae, when they're caterpillars, they have certain foods they like, and when they're flowers, they have different, possibly different flowers that, that they like, and they're really specific. Um, to be general, um, monarch butterflies, which I think most people know monarch butterflies, um, milkweed, milkweed, milkweed. Uh, there are all kinds of different milkweeds out in the world. Um, yeah, there's there's a monarch. That picture on the right, that's an, an egg. Oh, wow. Um, I had gotten a bunch of milkweed plants uh, in to, to plant in our butterfly garden. And before I even got them into the garden, these plants are just sitting up in our greenhouse and the monarchs just started coming and, and flying around. And I was like, what are they doing? And I started flipping over leaves and they were laying their eggs uh, all under these leaves. So milkweed is a huge uh, food source for the caterpillars. You know, it sometimes makes the milkweed look a little ugly because they, they eat it. Um, but it's absolutely a must if you're if you're planting a butterfly garden. All, like I said, all kinds of milkweeds. They're really pretty ones. There's some not so pretty ones too, but there are some really beautiful milkweeds. Um, yeah, go for it. Love that. Um, on a similar note, do you have any recommendations for um, any indoor herbal plants that can grow year round? Very specific. Well, I mean, if you have good light and that could be either you know a sunny window or you could buy plant lights you know um you can pretty much grow any anything indoors especially herbs herbs are pretty easy you know basil you know is great you know pretty much any time of the year uh gosh i like cilantro i like mexican food <laughs> so i always have a little pot of cilantro growing to put in my rice and in beans and whatnot um yeah, like I said, the, the biggest key though is just having enough light. And like I said, if you don't have a sunny window, that's okay. You can go to the store and for not much money at all, buy some plant lights and just stick your pots under there and they'll be fine. That is definitely something that I've picked up over the last year is getting a couple more plants. So we'll see what yeah. comes out. Awesome. Um, do you have an animal exhibit that you enjoy planting in the most or doing horticulture work in? the most? Hmm. Well, let's see. You know, when I first started at the zoo, I worked in the Amazonia exhibit pretty much exclusively. And that's a really neat exhibit because the animals, it's, it's sort of a big rainforest and the animals in there yeah, there's not cages, they're just there. And they're hopping, you know, there's monkeys and there's a sloth and there's birds and tortoises and just frogs, all kinds of things. And that was a really fun exhibit to work in because I can remember, you know, for example, one time I was, I was up in our, we had a lift that got me up into the trees and I was trying to cut a branch and we had these two TT monkeys and the female came over and she sort of sat about two feet away from me watching me and I'm not sure if she was you know saying what are you doing you know why are you cutting down my tree what's happening um but she kept getting closer and closer so I sort of slowed down and then it got to the point where I was just barely using my saw you know and she actually she put her hand on my hand and we kind of sawed together <laughs> you know and it was just it was one of these experiences is like yeah, you wouldn't get this experience working in a botanic garden. <laughs> you oh know? So that that was really neat when you have the animals right there. Um, 
yeah, it's pretty cool. What a great story. And I'm wondering if someone asked what the funniest thing you've experienced or seen an animal do, is that it? Or do you have another funny experience with an animal since your job here? Gosh, let's see. I mean, that was pretty, that was, you know, yeah. having the, the monkey help me. <laughs> you know, was, was pretty good. Um, I mean, I, you know, the, the really cool thing about this job is, you know, when you're in horticulture, there are some really cool things you do. And then there's some things like pulling weeds and probably anyone who has a garden, you know, pulling weeds is not fun. I mean, it's backbreaking. It's just not the most pleasurable thing that you could ever do with a day. But when you're pulling a weed and you look and, you know, four feet away from you is a zebra watching you. It's just, you, you feel this connection. And a lot of times, you know, early in the morning before a lot of people have gotten here, it's just a really cool thing to, you feel like you're making some connection with these animals. They probably don't care at all about me, but you know, you just, it's, 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 it's a cool job. I love that. Um, let's see what other questions we have in here. I will say, oh, I just thought of one thing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, probably the funniest thing is when, um, it, and again, this would be in Amazonia, when the monkeys would um, poop on someone, <laughs> which is not, you know, but, um, you know, the amazing thing, and we would, of course, come out and help, you know, clean people off, yeah. but, um, you know, people love it. And you tell them, oh, that's good luck. <laughs> you know, it's good luck to get pooped on. And uh, it's just neat to see people really immersed yeah. in, a, in a situation. And yeah, it's fine. All of their senses involved. <laughs> um, do we practice composting here at the zoo? Or can you speak to that at all? We do. Um, actually, we, well, not our department, but we, the zoo, actually compost some animal poop. Oh. Speaking of poop, um, yeah. they do do some way. composting of animal poop. Um, but we, in our department, all of our, you know, cuttings that we're taking when we do pruning, it all goes into one area and then we collect it and then bring it up to another area, put in big compost piles and, you know, turn it and, and then we will end up using it, you know, through the park. So yeah, we try to compost as much as we possibly can in the zoo. That's wonderful. Um, so you mentioned these two stories, one with the monkey and then the zebra. Uh, there's a question that came in about whether you share the same exhibit space with the animals when you're working. Sometimes. Um, it, you know, certainly depends on what the animal is. <laughs> um, even if they would let me go in with the tigers, I think I'd probably pass on that one. Um, they would not let me go in. <laughs> With the tigers. Um, but it depends. Um, often an animal will be removed from the habitat, uh, you know, for the brief time that we're out in the yard working. Uh, I did have one experience. I was uh, installing a new tree in the reptile exhibit in the anaconda exhibit. And I, I was waiting for the keeper to take the anaconda out of the exhibit so I could go in and I quickly realized that, no, we were just going to hang out together. Uh, and uh, so I went in the exhibit and I tell you, I was sweating because that anaconda was looking at me yes, I think <laughs> like I, I was tasty, but, uh, I would too. We, but it was fine. Obviously that, you know, the keepers are not going to put us in any situation that um, is dangerous. I mean, they know their animals. Um, I, I trust completely the keepers when they tell me that it's safe to go in with an animal. And, and if it's not, like I said, they do remove the animals uh, when we go in. So there are some animals that um, keepers or staff can go in with and some that we cannot. And right. we follow pretty strict uh, safety guidelines. As yes, well. definitely. Both very strict. Zoo and the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. Um, now, you mentioned how you started as a volunteer, and that's a very similar theme among all of the um, careers that we've really highlighted. Um, and we have quite a few of our guests, Megan and Lily and Levi and um, Anna Marie and George, all asked about how they can participate and help out at the zoo and how old they have to be to volunteer. 
Oh, well, actually, Shelly, that might be something you know better than I do. Is it 16? So for many of our, most of our volunteer positions, um, you do have to be 18, but we do ha allow volunteers um, to help out with the horticulture department and help with the planting around the zoo. Um, due to COVID-19, we are not currently recruiting for new volunteers, but check the zoo's website for updates. And when the zoo is ready to reopen uh, to the general public, I'm sure we will start recruiting shortly after that. So come back and check it out. Yeah, we, we would love to have you. Anyone yes. who wants to come help us, we're, we're glad, glad to see you. Wonderful. So let's see if there are any other questions coming in. I don't see any just yet. All right. So before we say goodbye, I do want to wish everybody watching a very happy beginning of Earth Month. Um, here at the Smithsonian, we celebrate Earth optimism, which is flipping the script from doom and gloom uh, to all of the things we have optimistic about conservation and sustainability. So Tina, in the spirit of Earth optimism, what is your favorite action that our viewers can take to start living a more sustainable lifestyle? Well, I mean, of course, you know, I have to say plant a garden. <laughs> Right. I think I'd be fired if I didn't say that. Um, just kidding. But, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, it, you don't have to have a yard. You don't have to have a big space to plant a garden. You can have like the question about the herbs. You, know, you can have just one little pot on a windowsill or under a light, um, you know, grow, grow a tomato. You know, it's so cool to like eat something that you have actually grown. And I know, you know, our country is so big and of course now we have people from Hungary and all over yes. the world but you know when here in the city I think a lot of there are a lot of people who haven't grown up with growing their own food um obviously if you live in more farmland kind of country in, in the U.S. you've it's it's nothing it's you know old school but you know it's very easy to do you don't need a lot of space and and it's fun and you know what if you kill a plant it's okay just learn from it and try it again, you know? So yeah, I'd definitely say plant a garden, no matter what, whether it's food or just something pretty that you like, do it. It adds oxygen to the atmosphere. It's, it's, it's all good. I love that. Tina, thank you so much for joining us today for the Wild Side of Steam. I have learned so much about horticulture and the importance of pollinators. And I know that um, our viewers did as well. We're getting such great responses in the chat. Um, so thank you again for joining us and um, I'll see you later. Thank so before you. Before we finish, um, I will send out just one more poll to our audience. Um, did you learn something new about zoo careers? Yes or no? Um, additionally, uh, we would love to hear your feedback on this webinar so that we can continue to learn and grow. So when you close out of this uh, webinar, a short survey will open up in your web browser and one of our educators will pop it in the chat for you as well. Um, and so thank you again to everybody for joining us. And again, thanks to Tina for the wonderful insight into her career. We hope you will join us um, for our upcoming webinars to continue the celebration of Earth Optimism. Our next webinar will be on April 21st, where we are collaborating with the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History and taking a virtual tour to see the sea lions on American Trail. Today. Then on <laughs> April 22nd, which is Earth Day, you can tune in to learn all about the wonderful conservation success of the black-footed ferrets in the American Great Plains. Uh, and you can find more information and register for both of those webinars on our zoo website, which will also be popped into the chat. And if this is your first wild side of STEAM, be sure to check out our YouTube playlist or our website to see uh, the six previous unusual careers. And our next Wild Side of Steam will be May 7th, where we will be celebrating World Migratory Bird Day. So on behalf of the Smithsonian's National Zoo and Conservation Biology Institute, we hope you have a wild day. <laughs>